Uh, Arundhati, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this conversation on behalf of the Citizen for Justice and Peace and the Gaudi Memorial Trust. I want to start, uh, Arundhati, with a little uh, meme I re received today because I found it quite funny and it's nice to be able to laugh on days like this when we are told that there might be a crackdown on the farmers at the Ghazipur and the Singhu border of Delhi and things are not looking particularly bright. The meme said petrol is rupees 91 in Rams India and rupees 53 in Sita's Nepal. And I found it really quaint. And I was looking at all the work that you have done on what you call ever since the late 1990s. I mean, of course, your first book, but also all your nonfiction writing, what you call development, development nationalism, market fanaticism, corporate media, corporate globalization. Where are we today with the farmers' protests, Arundhati? Oh, today we are without Gauri, that's for sure. And um, it is without so many of our comrades who are in jail, who are, you know, the space for any, co any kind of, not even dissenting opinion now, you know, the only space that's available is just open adoration of fascism, uh, you know, and I, I think we're, that's a very difficult place to be in. However, I, 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 I do think that, you know, we, we, we have to look at the farmers to learn from them how to reclaim a, a very wide, uh, a space, you know, a space where people who, who, you know, all these farmers unions, uh, all of us who have followed, you know, the debates on agriculture and so on for so long, and who know a little bit about Punjab, you know that it's an amazing thing for people with, you know, who have so many internal differences of opinion, you have big farmers, small farmers, landless labor, all of them have come together because they realize, like did the people protesting the CAA same time last year, that we are facing an existential crisis, you know, and therefore we really need uh, to not to not mm -hmm. marginalize ourselves or think of ourselves as marginal. We have to understand that we are taking the space and we have to take that space, you know, because because the ground beneath our feet is being hacked away. I, I often think about how, you know, in the, in the 60s, people were, were talking about revolution. They were fighting for the redistribution of land and wealth. <laughs> it slowly got squashed and then it became the big battles against displacement. Then it became you know, people just uh, begging for whatever little land they had not to be displaced. And then it has now come to people having to beg for their citizenship, you know. So the erosion on the one hand is enormous, but also I think the intellectual understanding about what is happening is getting very much more sharply honed because in the 90s when we used to connect um, corporate globalization, growing you know, waltzing arm in arm with this communal project. Uh, you know, people were quite, um, you know, suspicious of why we were making these connections. But today you can see it so clearly. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, that's very well put because even Gauri's li life and lived reality, if you like, our mission, if you like, you know, reflected this wondrous intersectionality because she was able to traverse, whether it is India's indigenous women, Adivasis, the homeless, Dalits, survivors and victims of mass targeted violence, impending fascism, proto-fascism, Gauri in espousing this so effectively and their cause so effectively, you know, became, uh, you know, uh, a symbol. So when, when those brutal bullets got into her on the 5th of September, 2017, and the outpouring we saw on the streets of Bang Bangalore, uh, Bengaluru on uh, September 12th. I mean, and I, we were looking at the people there and there were this Adivasi bonded labor who wept in sorrow. And, and we were asking Kavita and I, why did they weep? Was it out of, uh, you know, hope 
sense of loss of hope, a loss of connection. You know, what she symbolized, Nanu Gauri, I am Gauri, echoed everywhere. And I really think that this farmers movement and the anti-citizenship uh, amendment act movement, anti-CA and CNPR last year, brought forward these intersectionalities, you know, uh, that, that uh, Gauri's transition from just a mainstream journalist to something so much more uh, uh, embodied. And your work, Arundhati, also has constantly traversed these different planes, even fiction, non-fiction essays. Uh, the last one you wrote during the pandemic, uh, the, the one you wrote, you know, in, in, in 2001, the one you wrote, uh, you know, on, on the big dams, which is the greater common good, which then, of course, the major, uh, two major uh, periodicals, Outlook and Frontline, published in part or in full. Uh, I, I, I'm not a great one for conspiracy theories, but was there any reason why the pandemic article appeared in the Financial Times and not in an Indian publication, Arundhati? No, there wasn't any uh, real reason. Actually, the uh, FT, uh, the, the Financial Times actually asked me to just, uh, you know, say a few words because they were talking to a whole lot of writers and and uh, you know, as soon as as soon as the lockdown was called and the migration, the walking started, I just couldn't, you know, stay at home. I had a media card uh, because of you know the fact that I work for caravan often and so on. So I just went out, you know, and I, I, I walked with people and I spoke to them. And when when I started to write about it, I, I called the FT and I said, listen, I know you want three hundred words. <laughs> You know, that's not what I can do. It's much longer, so forget. So they said, no, 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 please send it. So I, so, so I did. You know, it, it was, but you know, as we know, that pandemic was not uh, just an Indian story. Although the Indian story is is horrendous, and the lockdown and how it was called and the 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 four hours notice and you know, of course, I've written about all that, but. These days, of course, you know, it, it doesn't even matter whether it's an Indian publication or an international publication, everything's on the net. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you spoke there of the winter of 2019 and the winter of 2020. And I think it's important to remember, as you said at the outset, that the winter of 2019 also in India and Delhi was a very spectacular winter in terms of resistance and protest. Yeah. Though, of course, it, it deteriorated very callously uh, into the February February 2020 violence against the pattern, uh, again the pattern is is so similar isn't it what happened uh, then uh, you know uh, sort of spinning it into a, 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 a pogrom um, the you know politicians so openly doing that calling for violence literally and you could see the police supporting that and uh, what happened in uh, you know during uh, the uh, during republic day once again you can see uh, you know a person very close to this ruling establishment uh, using it to kind of try and slide the ground from under the feet of this spectacular and very peaceful protest but uh, but I think that uh, the farmers are showing a great deal of wisdom and political spine, and I don't think you're going to be able to uh, turn them over that easily with this kind of moment. If you look at the issues that you have touched uh, uh, over the years, I mean, there have been so many of them, but there are also some fundamental issues, whether it is, I mean, yourself, you said displacement, 33 million to 56 million in the first 50 years of Indian independence. You've spoken about, like I mentioned before, corporate uh, fascism, the increase in corporatization of the media, uh, you know, and of course, uh, uh, you know, Hindutva supremacism. <coughs> uh, the world also is not a very nice place at the moment. Many other countries are also going through this, uh, these kind of uh, bitter shaking up from within. What sort of resistance do you see building up, considering you've been close to movements on the ground, very close to activists on the ground? You've seen how some of the protests and activisms have evolved over the years. What do you see as a writer, uh, how things will evolve? Well, you know, Tisa, first of all, I think, um, you know, although for the last 20 years, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I've never seen myself as someone who 
uh, necessarily writes about issues, you know. <laughs> it's always uh, yeah. a way of looking at the world and each thing one writes deepens your understanding about the next next thing. It's not, uh, you know, I'm not a journalist and I'm not someone who is just kind of commissioned to write things on different issues. It's a, you know, half the time my writing is also reflective of my own understanding of these things and it deepens my own understanding. Now, uh, you know, as we know, if I, if I can just put it, you know, conceptually, uh, often the way I look at it is that there were, uh, you know, these two locks that were opened in the late 80s and 90s, the lock of the Bakun Market and the lock of the Bazaar. And they both sort of uh, created two kinds of fundamentalisms, you know, uh, the economic fundamentalism and then this kind of Hindu right-wing fundamentalism, which then produces its own cycles of violence in both ways. Yeah. Uh, and and in, in both ways, both things led to this country increasingly becoming a police state, uh, increasingly passing laws that could not possibly be called democratic, yeah. increasingly being a place where you know, there are laws, but how they are applied depends on your caste, on your gender, on your class, on your ethnicity, on your religion, of course, you know. So it's a, it's, you're seeing the institutions of democracy just being hollowed out. And then when you begin to speak of these, and now we have a situation where, you know, I mean, we have 63 of the richest Indians who own more money than the uh, annual budget outla outlay for the union budget for last year, you know? And you have uh, <laughs> like the Oxfam study recently, which said that, uh, you know, during, during the lockdown, I mean, during the Corona pandemic in India, the richest hundred Indians increased their wealth by 35%, while, you know, in April, we were hemorrhaging some 170,000 jobs an hour. Yeah. So, so, and then you have things like these farmers laws where, where increasingly that, not just the wealth, but the control, the resources, the power is getting into fewer and fewer hands. Then you have the electoral bonds, which allow anonymous funding of parties. So you have a sort of hermetically sealed pipeline where <laughs> money and the power is just going around and around in these very ever smaller concentric circles. And if you critique these, the BJP has now become the richest party in the world, I think. And then they'll turn around and say, but what is the alternative? You know, <laughs> Because we are then supposed to look for an alternative, a person with a bigger chest or <laughs> more money or more power, you know, like another king. Whereas we actually need to, to, to look for people who understand this country, who have a heart, who love, these, love the people in this country. We've become like a country of ordinances and ambushes and secret announcements. And, you know, the, the citizenry is being treated as if it's an enemy by the government, including yeah. people who vote for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we, need to, we need to know that this kind of demagoguery, this kind of uh, concentration of power is not what we want. So the alternative has to be to make space for ourselves by like the farmers movement or the CA movement. You know, we try to expand the space and then something torpedoes these protests and that spray space is shrunken again. But we have to keep expanding it at every level. I mean, at the level of resistance on the street, at the level of art, at the level of literature, at the level of cinema, at the level of political parties and political leaders and elections, we have to know that the answer to what is the alternative is everybody but these people is the alternative. Everybody. What about our institutions then? He talked about our laws and uh, you talked about the kind of laws that have been passed, ordinance after ordinance. The last time we spoke was soon after the Bhima Kuring, our first crackdown in 2018. And you expressed a lot of concern about Umar Khalid. 
and he's in jail today and uh, so is stan swami and so is varavara rao and of course gn G- sai baba who you write about so often but it's not it's of course about these individuals first but it's also about that the parliament to use the to use the words of a young kashmiri who spoke to me soon after august 5 2019 when he spoke about parliament being used to demolish democracy brick by brick you know parliament being used to demol- demolish democracy brick by brick and there's a list of dark laws now you know you have the citizenship amendment act you have the uapa amendment of 2019 and also of 20- 2004 and 2009 before that you have the farmers laws three of them you have the labor codes which you know have overturned 48 pieces of labor legislation that gave some amount of dignity in the workplace you have the uttar pradesh damage to public and private property ordinance that is actually penalizing young rickshaw pullers or older rickshaw pullers for no crime that they committed and their their their, their little little holdings are being seized you have the love jihad laws yeah. it's literally a government declaring its war on its own people through yes. a process of majoritarian democracy so therefore i mean the challenge of course is protest of course everywhere but it's a very difficult period it's a very difficult period and you know uh, when you read when you read history you know that human beings have been through even more difficult periods you know and uh, we have to somehow get through this um uh, i don't i mean i don't know what i can say in terms of obviously in a conversation <laughs> i can't be like Oh, Arundhati, what is the solution? X. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not that, you know. All, all I can say is that as the as the breath is squeezed out of our bodies, our lungs have to expand as much as they can. You know, we have to learn ways to keep these spaces open. We have to learn ways in which to continue to write and communicate what we need to communicate, and we really have to also learn ways. not to spread hopelessness you know yeah. not to spread this spread despair we have to learn because so many people do are brave you know and so many yeah. people are so funny so many people uh, refuse to stop laughing at at uh, at these at these uh, at the antic these kind of antics that go on but essentially Uh, i don't have any one solution i mean you look at what's being done to the film industry you know yeah. how are artists how are artists to, supposed to survive if every breath you take has to be a cautious one yeah our business is the business of abandonment of experiment of thinking of complexity of contradiction you know we're not uh, we're not like uh, file pushers you know we're not bureaucrats we have to be allowed to make our mistakes we have to be allowed to uh, say things that people don't want to hear and if we are not allowed we have to do it anyway we have to find ways of doing it of surviving of moving forward moving back moving sideways and always taking that risk of pushing the envelope you know forward So I uh, actually I uh, I wanted to read something from one of my essays Please. about yeah, yeah, yeah. in fact it's a part where I'm talking about Gauri I just mentioned it's it's from a it's from a lecture that I had to do called the uh, it was a lecture designed for to be delivered Trinity at- Trinity yeah yeah I I read that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. talks back yeah yeah uh so for some of us every sentence spoken or written real or fake every word every punctuation mark can be torn from the body of a text mangled and turned into a court notice a police case a mob attack a television lynching by crazed news anchors or as in the case of the journalist gauri lankesh and so many less well known others an assassination Gauri was shot dead outside her house, outside her home in Bangalore in September 2017. Assassination is the extreme end of the spectrum. Elsewhere on it are threats, arrests, beatings, and if you're a woman, fake videos and character assassination. And not to forget the she should be gang raped threat. 
tax on people with a profile like me, whether they are wildly defamatory or absolutely true, or physical assaults on meetings and stages or legal harassment with false cases are usually appeals for the attention of the BJP high command by political workers aspiring to promotion, a kind of job application, because it's well known that those who show this kind of initiative are often rewarded. Lynchers are fated. Those accused of murder become cabinet ministers. In keeping with the spirit, well, I'll just skip a little bit. Anyway, all this is nothing compared to what millions of people in India are having to live through. I mention it only in order to think aloud about how this continuous unceasing threat affects writers and their writing. Each one of us re reacts differently, of course. Speaking for myself, as the pressure mounts and the windows are shut one by one, every cell of my writing brain seems to want to force them open again. Does that shrink or expand writers, sharpen <laughs> or reduce them? Most people I imagine believe it would restrict a writer's range and imagination, steal away those moments of intimacy and contemplation without which a literary text does not amount to very much. I've often caught myself wondering if I were to be incarcerated or driven underground, would it liberate my writing? Would what I write become simpler, more lyrical perhaps, and less negotiated? It's possible, but right now, as we struggle to keep the windows open, I, I believe our liberation lies in the negotiation. Hope lies in texts that can accommodate and keep alive our intricacy, our complexity, and our density against the onslaught of the terrifying, sweeping simplifications of fascism. As they barrel towards us, speeding down their straight, smooth highway, we greet them with our beehive, with our maze. We keep our complicated world with all it seems exposed alive in our writing. On uh, June 30th, 2017, that is two months and five days before she was shot dead, I saw and read a Facebook post by Gauri where she links to an article and she said, I love this novel by A. Roy. And she's talking <laughs> yeah. about she's she talking about the Ministry of yeah. Unfinished Happiness and she, Utmost Happiness, Ministry of Un yeah. Utmost Happiness. And uh, yeah, she sorry. sent me the she sent me a uh, I mean, just before she was killed, actually, she sent me a photograph of herself holding up this book, you know, which I still have. Yeah. With me. yeah. yeah. And uh, then I remember when the, you gifted me the book and uh, uh, before that I'd read it and I was just thinking about the graveyard and the, you know, what you write about the graveyard there and about the fact that the graveyards are mostly Muslim. And then suddenly I thought about uh, Kavita. I suddenly thought about our Gauri's graveyard because it's, she's, she's a Lingayat and she's buried. And so is her father. And uh, uh, Kavita has recently reclaimed even uh, Parvati Lankesh's graveyard, you know, just now. And she was there on the 26th of January. And then I thought of the word Azadi somehow uh, because it's, it's there, of course, in, in your book, but also because what the word Azadi has come to mean for Indian politics and on the streets of India, following the JNU agitation and Rohit Vemula's death and how the young student leaders were incarcerated. So language and protest and culture is also becoming quite joyful and very, very subversive. So it's, it's, yes, it's also quite, yeah. I mean, we, have to, <coughs> we have to find those, uh, those, those seams, you know, and expand them. And sometimes, you know, there are times when the tide the tide, like the tide is, is, is rising and, and you've got to know that you've got to secure yourself somehow, you know, you've got to <laughs> keep that safe and then wait for that for the moment when it will pass, because it will pass, you know, whatever becomes of us, it will pass and, and yeah. we will have to face it down. And we do have to read and remember people who have been through so much more than we are going to now and, and have survived, you know. And uh, it's, it's also, I think, we've got to understand that, you know, things like um, court cases and appealing to, to these institutions. Uh, if you read history, you know, like 
one of Hit the moments where Hitler was given a stage to perform on was when he was accused of sedition, you know, and <laughs> the judge gave him an opportunity to perform. So it it really uh, it was really uh, something which s- sped up Germany's journey to fas- towards fascism and Nazism, you know. Uh, we're up against something huge and you you know it's really i feel that you know culturally uh, with music and art with protests with all these things together have to come it'll it'll never happen with some bureaucracy or some one case that we won or some one enlightened judge that uh, gave a good decision you know although the good thing about about uh, legal legal a uh, legal approach for me is only like uh, you have done in gujarat you know like whatever happens whatever happens with the sanj africa case the compilation of that documentation will be history you know that's important. i mean that that process is history because that is truth telling i mean with 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 all your acceptance that the institution is not just conservative but of often very archaic when it deals with evidence Yeah. and particularly evidence which is like prized open from within intelligence bureau records and within a fire fire control room we messages have keep, we have to keep the records we have to keep yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of the records, you know yeah yeah all times like like the uh, jkccs in kashmir does you know yeah. it's been uh, uh, you know kind of almost shut down now because the evidence compilation is so 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 threatening to the state threatening. but and you have you have and you have spoken about 8 to 10000 disappeared in kashmir with the graves there yeah yeah and and we are facing something now like something of that magnitude with the humanitarian crisis in assam where there are 2.2 million people who are completely facing the specter of statelessness and no courts in the world I mean, we've calculated, and we find that if you look at the court solution, it'll take two hundred and thirty-four years yeah. at the average with which our court cases go in this country. You know? So there's no way a court solution is possible because it's two point two million people with their families yeah. who are and, and who that, are who are excluded that, from that, NRC, uh, who are de- yeah, sorry. No, and that calamity is what they wanted to import into the rest of the country with the NRC, uh, CA, NPR, you know. so yeah uh, yeah i mean it's and and you see you know these man made catastrophes That's right. from one after another after another after another you know uh yeah. from uh, you know from demonetization to gst to um you know just one after the other they create and 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 you know the whole the whole abrogation of section 370 in kashmir has directly led to the situation in in ladakh where where the chinese yeah. territory and the indian government you know even bring it said to admit that that has happened me yeah. well you have an economy that is in negative growth you have to hemorrhage money to keep troops on the border you know yeah. troops at sub zero temperatures battle ready all year round people will just die soldiers will just die because of the weather condition even if there isn't a war you know yeah, yeah. so i mean uh, i i just wanted to uh, the millions of people displaced now we are talking about a few million facing the specter of statelessness through in just one state and god knows how many million in the country we are looking at you know 46 crore which is like uh, 460 million people who were migrant workers who were completely unheard of and unthought of in terms of policy till you know the few weeks of the uh, covid lockdown forced the rest of india to look at them so are we looking at the kind of a strange evolution of our democracy where policies are being made for just the very very few and you have a con- complete capture of parliament by those who are kind of in conjunct with you know corporates and television filmmakers and studios so that you you're not just telling the story so you know we know that you know and we know how the election machinery is getting compromised but at the same time 
we have to we have to ask ourselves why is it that people are so easily pursued no so easily persuaded to work yeah. against to vote against their own interests you know yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is this is the psychology that i think we really need to understand because uh, you know coming back to what happened in germany even when even when the nazi party's policies so clearly led to the destruction of germany when 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 uh, you know the soviet union the soldiers were at the gates when the americans had arrived and berlin was falling but still nobody blamed hitler like there wasn't such a uprising against him you know other people were blamed but there was this so there's this sometimes people get you know caught in a kind of psychology which is hard to explain right i mean when stalin died people in the, in the gulag in the camps wept people who he had put into the camps <laughs> so why are, how is it that we are increasingly stuck getting getting caught up in this i mean not we as individuals but but whole masses of people you know uh, it's i think that's that's a very troubling question and it's a question that is very difficult to find an answer to because uh, people try people try in different ways but i think it's very difficult to actually you know kind of clinch an answer to that way that one but uh, uh, we find for instance there are moments of sheer uh, breakthrough like the farmers protest show us or the anti ca protest show us when other unities are forged and other realities come to the fore but yeah, suddenly then after yeah it also has a lot to do if you look at the actual figures you know of yeah, how many yeah. people actually came and voted for the bjp in the last election yeah yeah yeah, yeah 17% yeah. or something you know yeah, yeah. but but the, the 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 mathematics is figured in ways that uh, you know allow a victory even it's just a small minority that has actually voted them in they come into power in a majority but it's a it's a you know it's a very um, it's a very very troubling situation where how is this going to break through because at some point you're going to see a country torn apart a country that you know there's the, the threads are wearing thin even the the ways in which this government functions it's not eventually the anti ca protests the farmers protest none of it has gone away you know even though it was broken up the the the, the anger is simmering and it's about much more though the demands are to to repeal these three laws the rage is from much more than that you know because you can see people in economic distress uh unable to see the future yeah and yet we've got a kind of crazy kind of beauty in our pluralism uh, in the way that we negotiate spaces at different levels even with the cruelty that really is, yeah that is it you know ultimately i keep saying it, that this mm. is a battle of lovers against haters you know yeah. it's a battle like none of us would be Uh, you know would be fighting if it weren't that we loved something about here yeah. you know if it weren't that we we were fighting to save something too we are fighting to change things we are fighting to 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 uh also preserve things you know we are fighting for the love of the land for the love of the landscape and 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 you have you have this continuous hateful divisiveness which is what is uh keeping them in power right now but i don't think that it can uh last much longer you know depending on the scale of history that you choose to well i only sometimes think of caste and i think that caste has lasted for the longest time and it's one of the most brutal systems that we allowed because of its yeah, continuing it's and perpetual vile yeah it's a form of uh, micro fascism you know where you yeah yeah your your uh, you know it works at every level to keep the big structures in place and when you look at when you look at uh, you know 
when you look at the, the the people, the dynasties that own the big corporations, when you look at the media family dynasties, you see a situation where a very small caste class elite controls all resources, all money, all decision making, and as I said, funnel and the, and and the pipeline funnels it through the political elite, and the money goes round and round, the power goes round and round, and it has for for centuries for sure but that doesn't mean things have not also changed you know things yeah, have yeah. no you got an you you had a fule you had an ambedkar you had a nanak kabir before that basavana in karnataka who actually threw open spaces historically even though they were faced with killings and genocide as as a uh, uh, reprisal mm-hmm. uh, i mean i somehow tend to keep coming back to this question with you because it uh, i did it last time as well but i'm going to because i it's about kavita gauri as well that uh, and i really was very very impressed by that one first essay that i read of yours which is the great indian rape trick which i think was 1993 yeah. and uh, particularly because i remember it was a lot of very very important conversations happened because of the celebration around bandit queen and many of us were quite repulsed by that film and therefore the that essay i think it was in the sunday magazine that yeah. you wrote it yeah yeah and so that's for me when arundhati roy as a writer and as a critic uh, sort of uh, stays has stayed as a name would you just like to talk about that a little bit because it you know you look at that and you look at the hatras case which happened last september and that hasty cremation and then look at the series of violent crimes in uttar pradesh at the moment against young girls and women particularly dalits you know and it's you just such a that, you know i mean you can see how um you know even the even the kind of uh patriarchy and misogyny that is intrinsic to this regime is becoming institutionalized and keeps appearing yeah. in the speech in the ordinances in all of that i mean madhya pradesh wants women who are not living with their families to register with the police yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you have uh, yeah and as you said the 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 laws of i was looking at the up uh, ordinance against religious conversion and while obviously it's openly hostile to uh, muslims and christians and so on look at if you look at what is saying about women you know and it, and it also equates women dalits um, and scheduled tribes with minors you know yeah. Yeah, so no agency no agency at no all agency whatsoever and yes and and i mean the 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 bandit queen essays the great indian rape trick when i saw that film i uh, you know I'd, obviously i'd read the book that it said it was based on um and uh, you know i i saw with what glee they showed phulan devi who as we know was one of india's greatest bandits you know she she was the one bandit the police could not find she eventually surrendered she negotiated her own surrender which they reneged on but in the film she's never shown as you know it's literally it's a film that turned india's greatest bandit into history's most famous victim of rape and how much they loved those rapes you know showing them again and again some of which we don't know whether they even happened or not yeah and she has a very interesting uh, she has a very interesting account of her own life in the diaries that she uh, smuggled out of prison and uh, <clears throat> then i met her and i spent quite a lot of time with her she's an interesting person you know she was not some virtuous goody goody uh, kind of feminist activist at all like she was a <laughs> she was a bunch of trouble but she was it was very interesting so that was what i wrote and and i also said that nobody should have the right to show the rape of a living woman without her consent even yeah. if she was raped she should be able to tell you and she should be able to decide even if she wanted it to be shown how she, how it should be shown you know so yeah those were those were things but like now you see a regime that somehow is is less outraged by rape than it is by transgression of love you know yeah <laughs> and finally i want to end with a little bit of kerala because there's so much of kerala 
in you and in your work, particularly your first uh, first novel. And uh, uh, and I, <coughs> Kerala responded in a crazy way to Gauri's killing, <coughs> as it would and expectedly should. And if one thing that Kavita has done in the last uh, uh, so many years, three and a half years since I've gotten to know her even more closely, <coughs> is just go to every single meeting call in every single part of the country. Uh, because young women are saying, you know, that we want to be Gauri and we identify with Gauri and we are Gauri. <coughs> so what is so special about Kerala? Hmm? But they don't want, I mean, they should not, I mean... You know, the killing is such a... Yeah, yeah. <coughs> mm. Absolutely. No, but the fact is that... I didn't mean that. What I meant is that the response from young women activists and yeah. journalists and writers and filmmakers mm. to a person like Gauri has been... has just kind of transgressed every bound. I mean, I go to a little place in rural Maharashtra and I find a special edition <coughs> of a weekly being brought out for Gauri, you know. I've just not seen that kind of resonance uh, and it's not as if the uh, Narendra Dhabulkar or uh, Govind Pansare or Kalburgi also did not do spectacular work. Of course they did. And each one of them and even those who are incarcerated. But it was something about her and her personality and her ability to reach out that I think her, has got, yeah. Her, uh, her azadi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her yeah. azadi. Her, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think that you know, for young women to see people like her embrace life, you know, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to, to realize, to fight, to laugh, to, to uh, you know, to, to live the full spectrum, even if it means that you die with a bullet. I yeah. think it's liberating for young women and it puts some steel in their spine. It gives them something to, to, to hold on to. You know, and that is so very important. You know, this has uh, been such an important conversation which we've been wanting to have uh, uh, on uh, the, with you for a long time, uh, Arundhati. And thank you so much for agreeing to it. Uh, Kavita and I also were keen today to... There was a little... Uh, something that Kavita did, you know, every... I mean, for months uh, after 2017, every other morning, after a very difficult night, I would find one of these poems in my mailbox you know and she wrote these poems to her sister and uh, as a very special uh, gift uh, CJP kind of made a little booklet out of it and gave it to her on the first uh, anniversary of the assassination <laughs> and yeah I'll send it to you I'll send you a few copies and we just thought I mean it's been there and we just thought we'd also uh, sort of officially release it, re-release it again because we want people, more people to read the poems. And before I ask Kavita to do that and to say a few words about the poems or maybe read the poems, whatever she likes, I just want to say what I said in the uh, at the introduction of the book, that not only do we miss you, Gauri, uh, but so does the young man at the saloon in Raja Rajeshwari Nagar who cropped your very stylish hair because your friends have met him and he really misses you. And you're a fearless tigress kitten. And this is from your loving sister. Kavita, it's over to you. Thank you, Tista. Thank you, Arundhati. It's a wonderful day, Tista, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. meeting me here. Yeah. I love and uh, because uh, it's ironic that uh, Gauri was a great fan of Arundhati and she had never met Yeah, we used to we used to talk about she she would all uh, I think she tra she would always translate the things that I wrote. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Atista, of course, she's so much in love with you. I mean, she would tell me all about you. <laughs> and it's nice to know that today uh, being a tomorrow being her birthday. Atista, you organizing this is wonderful. And you know, I keep uh, wondering many times what would she have said during all these three years and three, two months. I keep wondering what would Gauri have said during maybe CAA or your fight in the Assam or the, you know, now the farmer's agitation, what's happening, how would she have reacted, would she have gone and, you know, stood with the protesters and started writing, things like that. And then I wonder, including Umar, who she was considered her son, you know, and Jignesh who won the election. Kanaya has become so close to us during these many years and, you know, he's very close to my daughter and me and my mom. So it's become a very transformative life for me as well. 
and especially with you, T starts uh, become like uh, you know you become another sister to me, the missing uh, you know part of the Gauri, and and I keep wondering as just now Anuti said, I would ask Gauri also if not the big chess, who is the bigger chess, who who is the alternative. And now Arunuthi has given a very good answer to that. Actually, saying that yeah, yeah we that want a bigger there. chest. We want a team of intelligent yes. people. Yeah. yeah, and anybody but them, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful listening to you. It's almost like listening to my sister. I'm glad people like you are there to voice out these things. And I've heard Arunuthi speak, and you speak uh, fearlessly and admire it. And I hope I, I mean, I do to, to my films, but uh, apart from that, to speak openly. I still don't. I can't. So you know, you have your poems. You you just have to be yourself, Kavita, and that's enough. And yeah, I'm uh, happy yeah. people like uh, people uh, like you are there, and I'm thank you for organizing this. And as you said, it's a wonderful book what you grow got out, and you know it's with pictures of me and my sister, and it's mm. very beautiful. I don't know if Would the poems think? are great or bad or whatever it is. It was just they are very good. They are very very good. Uh, can we can we show the book, please, team? Yeah, yes. can we show the book? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. We just show the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And through CJP, and it's beautiful. This some of the pictures, especially, are very very nice. Yeah. Lovely. So, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I never thought of myself as a poet. Do I keep telling my father you made me wrong because I mean, a kavita and guy. I was very bad at poetry. But this is—I don't even know what this poetry was. But it's just my feelings and my anguish when I lost her, and it was painful to sleep or painful to even think, you know. So it's been uh, kind of therapeutic to have people like you and uh, with uh, with me and hearing all of you talk. And just, uh, you know, I just think that I just think that um, in 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 the ministry of utmost happiness, you know, eventually it all happens in a graveyard where. Someone builds a guest house called the Jannat Guest House, and in every room there's a tomb, and the and 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 death and life then become like uh, separated only by an osmotic membrane, and we just <laughs> yeah. in the other room, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've got to talk to her and. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. It's it's wonderful. And, uh, will you will lovely. you read a poem, Kavita? Will you read a poem? Oh, you not don't feel that too. You read it, Tista. You're good at it. You read whichever you like in it. I just chose these ones, if you don't mind. Please, anything, um, anything. She's written a beautiful one, which I'll take the liberty of reading. It's called "The Last Ten Seconds." Sometimes I feel you are here. It's just one of those hectic days, so you haven't visited us. But most times, reality punches in my gut, and I know you are gone. forever i turn i shiver i reel i feel like puking but my stomach is empty much like everything else agonized when awake nightmares and sleep as i try to relive the your last 10 seconds that's all the time it took to end your voice the cops tell us let me imagine those 10 seconds the killer a coward no doubt hiding behind a helmet rushes towards you ya yeah, ko what are you doing magani the first shot you boli magani who the fuck are you not my comrade not my blood certainly not my creed you think you've got, got become big because your chaddi got longer and now you wear pants come end me let's see how dare you i'm never ending Ten seconds, three more bullets, and you were gone. Did Isha, Amma, or I flash through you? The love, the care, the concern. Did thoughts of your comrades flicker in you? The same comrades who converted you from a little chirping sparrow to a roaring tigress. Till the last bullet lip stopped it all. You lay there in a pool of blood, but have you stopped? A thousand others continue your fight. Here, they're everywhere. Every drop of your blood, a protest, with more fervor and vigor, confusing me further. If I voice for the voiceless like you, am I you? If I am silent, am I dead? Thank you, Tista. That was beautiful. Really, thank you. 
Arundhati, would you just like to say something more? No, I would just I just say that you know we're so we're so lucky to have someone like her in our life. You know, we we uh, she expanded us, and uh, I think we'll remember that. You know, the Azad Akka. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arundhati, for for yeah, your patience. Yeah, you understand. Thank you so much, Kavita. Yeah, big hugs, big hugs, Kavita, to you too. Thank you, thank you, Krista. Thank you. Yeah.